I'm Alicia Menendez in for Ari Melber with developing news out of the Biden DOJ. Also ahead tonight, Arizona Republicans actively pushing the big lie with a bizarre election faux audit. Plus, emotions running high in North Carolina after the police shooting of Andrew Brown. But we begin with a landmark probe from the Biden DOJ and the broader shift in governance in Biden's first 100 days on everything from spending and COVID to policing. Today, Attorney General Merrick Garland announcing a civil rights investigation into the Louisville Police Department, 13 months after the police killing of Breonna Taylor. It's the second civil rights probe the DOJ has launched in five days, also now looking into the Minneapolis Police Department. This is a reversal from the Trump DOJ, which all but suspended federal oversight of troubled police agencies. The investigation will assess whether LMPD engages in a pattern or practice of using unreasonable force. It will determine whether LMPD engages in unconstitutional stops, searches, and seizures, as well as whether the department unlawfully executes search warrants on private homes. The new probe launching as Biden approaches 100 days in office with real momentum for his broader agenda. Brand new NBC polling showing him at 53% approval. CBS News putting him at 58%. Indeed, as of tonight, Biden has spent every day since taking office above 50% approval. His predecessor did not crack 50% once. The majority is with Biden. It is not a clean partisan divide, which may surprise those who depict the country as hopelessly gridlocked. Here's the reaction over on Fox. Ultimately, right now, Joe Biden has got uh, pretty dog doggone high uh, approval ratings. His economy is working. If it's 80% says we are a divided nation and you've got anything in a majority, that, that given the climate, that's pretty good. Pretty good indeed. Biden now says he's trying to capitalize on his momentum. His first speech to the joint session of Congress on Wednesday, where he's expected to go big on the progressive agenda. Joining me now, Jason Johnson, professor with Morgan State University and MSNBC contributor. Victoria DeFrancesco Soto, assistant dean for civic engagement at the LBJ School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas at Austin and an MSNBC contributor. And Eugene Daniels, author of Politico's Playbook and White House correspondent. It is good to see you all. Jason, I want to start with you. What do these moves from Garland tell you about the urgency that DOJ is feeling? And where do you see it fitting into this bigger progressive agenda? Uh, it means Vanita Gupta and Kristen Clark are going to be sinking their teeth into uh, into a, a prominent area that has had consistent problems with criminal justice. But what it also says is that, <coughs> excuse me, is that Joe Biden is not going to just give lip service to these kinds of issues. It would have been very easy to sort of leave what happened in Louisville alone, but he has actually heard the, the concerns and the protests and the anger and the frustration of Americans of all colors, but especially African-Americans, who he owes his job to, that these kinds of issues have to be addressed. So Merrick Garland coming out there and saying, we're going to Louisville, that puts the word out that every other police district across America may be in the crosshairs if they show a consistent pattern of abusing people. And I, I suspect that President Joe Biden is going to talk about that more in his speech to Congress, not just the George Floyd Policing Act, but other important issues that are necessary to advance civil rights in this country. And I suspect you are right, Jason. I mean, Eugene, coming in, the Biden administration, they knew what they had to do. They had to get the pandemic under control from a public health perspective. Then they needed to deliver financial relief. You see in these numbers, Americans are rewarding the administration for those actions. But when you have poll numbers, Eugene, that are this strong, one of two things tends to happen, right? Your team either begins to become obsessed with not doing anything to jeopardize those numbers, or they use those numbers as an argument for doing even more. Where is the White House right now? They're in that latter camp. This is not a White House. This is not a president who um, seems like they're ready to, at any point, take their foot off the pedal, as it's been put to me many, many times. You know, they, they came in and they had... You know, any president that had the hand that Joe Biden was dealt would be 
scared and be worried. And it, it, it's, it was all, you know, give one person a pandemic, and that's a heavy lift by itself, but you add in all the other things that they had, the recession, the racial strife, climate change, another big issue for them, um, they would be worried. But this White House has continuously, one, focused on the things they know that are popular with the American people, um, that is COVID relief, getting money in people's pockets, getting shots in arms, they're getting high marks on that, and also now moving into infrastructure moving into, um, we're supposed to hear from him on paid family and medical leave, probably more information about how they're looking at health care in um, it, this week from him. And so all of those things are really popular with the American people. Those numbers they're seeing are pushing them to keep doing that. And this was the guy who was supposed to be the big moderate, right? We kept hearing that this was the president who, out of the, everyone that was running, he was going. To, he was never going to do anything unless Republicans were on board. We've seen that not to be the case, and they've spent a lot of time making sure that left part of their flank <laughs> is shored up, and I continue to do that. You know, Vicky, the numbers that stand out in the opposite direction are the president's approval ratings on guns and immigration. Only 34 percent approval on his handling of guns, 33 percent approval of his handling on immigration, according to NBC News polling. So let's talk about immigration specifically. Those numbers to me say both that Republicans have succeeded in turning a humanitarian crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border into an opportunity to score political points. I don't know if you saw this, but Jake Sherman tweeted out earlier that the Wi-Fi password at the House GOP retreat was Biden border crisis. Those numbers also say, though, to me, that people who understand the value of immigration in this country, they want to see Biden repeal Title 42. They want to see him push a pathway to citizenship through Congress. So, I think you can look at those numbers and say no one's happy with the status quo. Republicans are going to weaponize this issue regardless of what he chooses to do. Go big. What do they say to you as someone who is actually familiar with polling? So when I first saw these numbers, Alisa, you know, first of all, it's the 53 percent, really strong, really steady for Biden's first 100 days. But once you start piecing things, you start to see some issues. And like you said, Guns is at 34, immigration's at 33, China's also at 33. So I'm looking at the bottom three issues that are the most problematic for the Biden administration, and which is the most difficult of the three, it's immigration. Because immigration, as you just pointed out, Alicia, is the one issue where Republicans are coming full force on, on the offense. They have been getting on Biden since day one about being soft on immigration. And at the same time, Biden, on the left flank, is being pressured to do more on the humanitarian cause. This is a huge issue because the Republicans are not letting up on that. The second main issue with this is the fact of the image. And a picture is worth a, a thousand words. And every day, I see images at the border that just crush me. They crush me and some others who feel the same way I do about immigration. But on the other side of the aisle, you see folks who are immigration restrictionists that are getting increasingly frustrated at so many people coming over, and that's fueling them. So this is really the biggest issue that the Biden administration is facing, and it doesn't change overnight. There's a little bit of time, and we have Kamala Harris working on trying to figure something out with the Central American countries, but something is going to have to happen. There's going to have to be a dent if we are going into 2024 and we're still in the same situation. President Biden is in a lot of trouble. So he has a little bit of time. But immigration is one of the thorniest issues, and he really needs to dig deep on this. Well, and Jason, beyond that, Republicans are really struggling to come up with a line of attack that sticks. I mean, it seems like the best they've come up with to describe President Biden is boring, as though they have forgotten that this is a presidency and yeah. not a reality show. So, Jason, where do these approval numbers leave them? Well, they don't help, but you got to remember that the Republican Party's leadership right now are people who were in favor of the insurrection, a guy named Ted Cruz who nobody likes, a guy named Matt Gates who's in trouble for possibly having inappropriate relationships with teens, a guy named Lindsey Graham who nobody believes because his opinion changes with a weather vane, and a hidden president who's, uh, you know, hiding out in Mar-a-Lago right now waiting for people to kiss the ring. They have no leader and they have no messaging. So, and Mitch McConnell has pretty much been outmaneuvered, and this is a sentence I never thought I'd use a year ago, but Mitch McConnell has been outmaneuvered by Joe Biden. So the Republicans can't come up with a coherent message, so they definitely can't come up with anything to attack Joe Biden with. This is why Donald Trump was afraid to run against him. This is why the party has difficulty now. 
their only hope is an unforced error on the part of the Democratic Party. And so far, that doesn't seem to have happened. The biggest stumbling block is something that Joe Manchin might do. And again, I've thought all along that Joe Manchin is eventually going to go along with eliminating the filibuster, which would just make Joe Biden even more powerful and successful with policy. I mean, Eugene, this White House is acutely aware that they have to keep selling their accomplishments to the degree that I can almost hear Alec Baldwin in my head yelling, always be closing, because of the amount we talk about how they have to keep selling their agenda. What does that sell? What is it going to look like on Wednesday night? Yeah, I think that the thing, you know, we kept wondering why it was taking so long for them to set up this joint session of Congress. And it seems like something that was written for, you know, a political uh, TV show, right? You have it right at the 100 days. You can talk about all the great things that you've done. And so we're, what we're going to see, like, with, with usually with these things, is he's going to talk about COVID. He's going to talk about how he has gotten the pandemic under control, that um, they've hit and doubled, um, ended up doubling the vaccine goals that they had. Um, but there's also, you know, there's there's some vaccine hesitancy out there. So he's going to talk about that as well, the things that they're doing to counteract that. And then he's going to talk about how he's doubling down on this idea of him not being as, as moderate as people thought when it comes to policy, right? And so, you know, if you like me spending a lot of money for COVID, I got another couple trillion dollars for you. If you like $2 trillion on infrastructure, we got some more for you. So I think that aspect is really fascinating. And I think that is something we should keep talking about because that is not not the amount of money that we're used to uh, moderate Democrats talking about. There used to be a time where Republicans and Democrats talked about the deficit of, as if it was this holy thing. And that is no longer what the American people, after a year in this pandemic, are care about. They don't seem to care that much about the, the deficit. What they're focused on is what can he do to help us? And I think that is what this White House has watched. They've seen that the involvement of the federal government, even for Republicans, even for Republican voters, is something that people are a lot more interested in than they were a few years ago. Yeah, when you're desperate for relief, you have a lot less appetite to talk about the deficit. You know, Vicky, as part of that bigger cell, Adrian Carasquillo over at Newsweek reporting today, as part of the Build Back Together 501c4, a big emphasis on Latino voters. And they are bringing in heavy hitters, names our audience will be familiar with, Chuck Chuck Rocha, largely credited with Bernie Sanders' success with Latino mm -hmm. voters, Myra Macias from Latino Victory, Sochi Hinojosa, who was last at the DNC. I mean, that tells me that they're serious about this and that they know they have work to do. Yeah, they're learning from their mistakes of this past election. Yes, they did win the Latino vote, but not in the margin that, that the Democrats were expecting. And what, what came through in this past election was a recognition that, oh, wait, Latinos are swing voters. Because if we go back to a decade or two, Latinos were voting for Republicans of upwards of 40 percent. Here in Texas, Republicans have always done very well with Latinos. So I think it was a wake-up call, and it's a very smart investment in going after the Latino vote, in doing that political marketing of what has Joe Biden, what have the Democrats done for you? Because quite honestly, a lot of Latinos didn't know how to answer that question and didn't come out and vote. And what is so important here is that we're seeing the micro-targeting in the swing states, right, of Pennsylvania, of Florida, of Arizona. Texas is supposed to be in the second rollout. So I think this is really important because Latino voters aren't just an afterthought that you should go after them in the last couple of weeks or the last couple of months of an election. They need to be constantly courted, just like every other electorate. So I think this is going to pay off handsomely. Victoria DeFrancesco Soto and Eugene Daniels, thank you both. Jason Johnson, we're going to see you back a little bit later in the show.